On the first slide, you can see the kind of landscape that uh, is um, characteristic of the language spoken there, Upper Kaskakrim. It's named after uh, a big river, Kaskakrim River, in Alaska, and uh, it's an Athabasca language spoken in the upper drainage of that river. This is the map of um, Alaskan languages. Upper Kaskakrim is right in the middle of this oval. And uh, uh, around it are various languages I will be also mentioning in my talk. Uh, Koyokon in the north, uh, Tanana, or more commonly called Lower Tanana in the east, uh, Denaina or Tanaina in, in the south, and uh, in the west, two other Athabasca languages, Kalipichuk and Dekhinak, otherwise called Ingalik and uh, also Central Yupik and Eskimo language. Uh, the upper Kaskakrim people are uh, among the 11 or according to a different system, 12 Athabascan tribes in uh, Alaska. And it was identified as a distinct group in early 1960s. Before that it was considered part of a Gaelic or some kind of uh, obscure group between other major groups. Uh, most of the people of um, pure Upper Kaskakum descent are um, living in the village called Nikolai. Uh, they've been uh, Russian Orthodox since the 19th century. And uh, it's a very small group. It was originally a small group including several hundred individuals. And uh, according to my counts, they occupy the territory approximately of the size of Austria. Uh, they've been having a semi-seasonal uh, lifestyle, moving from one place to another, following animals and fish. And as for the language itself, uh, as other Athabasca languages, it uh, has extremely complex verb morphology I won't be speak, talking about verbal morphology at all, but just trust me, it's, it's really difficult. And uh, now there are, it's a more about language, there are about 15 people remaining as uh, fully fledged speakers. Uh, and uh, the number 450 includes uh, all people who are at least partially upper custody. Many of them are mixed, mixed blood. Uh, so it's a really small group and a sm small number of uh, speakers. And the youngest fully fledged speaker was born in 1952, and there are a, no a number of latent younger speakers uh, who can, can say something, but not quite. And uh, uh, my my study is uh, been, is based on uh, uh, eight field trips by now, and. Uh, yeah, when I first started studying this language, I was following the footsteps of Ray Collins, a uh, SIL linguist who did basic study of that language in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, Upper Kaskakrim is unusually pure in terms of its linguistic material. Uh, there are very few loan words. I will be discussing a partial exception of several dozen Russian loan words but generally very few uh, on the worldwide scale. Uh, I cannot find any identifiable grammatical boring, maybe just with one exception, but um, almost nothing. And also, this language is very uh, conservative in, in the sense that it's probably close to the original Athabascan type that we can kind of reconstruct from what we know about about 40 Athabascan languages in North America. Uh, so my goal here would be to first describe and then explain, try to explain this uh, phenomenon, quite enigmatic phenomenon. Uh, I will start with some uh, comments about old prehistory and geography and then move to potential contexts that happened or didn't happen uh, in this language. Uh, so, uh, as for old prehistory, it seems that the upper Kaskakrim area in the upper drainage of the Kaskakrim River in the very center of Alaska uh, 
is close or at least it's a, maybe it's included in the original Athabasca homeland. Uh, looking for homelands is always tricky and there are a number of studies. Um, according to what various experts say, it looks like uh, geographically it's very close. And uh, even more importantly, the area was uh, occupied by Athabascans for some thousand years. Uh, and uh, there are different opinions. Uh, Kraus, Michael Kraus said something like three, four thousand years. And uh, Jim Carrey, another major expert, is uh, giving figures from six to twelve thousand years for ancestors of modern Athabascans staying in this area. Okay. After they split from other related groups such as Kiyat and Kingit. Huge periods of time. time. Uh, during this period of time, whether it's, it's uh, three or 12,000 years, we don't have any evidence of any unrelated languages around, uh, around that area during that time. And that, uh, in relates in a complicated way to the general scenario of how America was populated. There are all kinds of theories. They are changing during the last uh, uh, couple of decades radically, and uh, apparently all the ancestors of more modern American Indians somehow traveled through this area sometime, but it's, it's, um, the specific scenarios are still unclear. And Athabascans are those, the only ones who left that area and uh, who decided to stay there for a long time or at least managed to survive there in very difficult conditions. Um, there is a notion of uh, geolinguistic conservatism that was introduced by uh, Jim Carrey, some kind of resistance to change, including all kinds of change, internal change, or externally induced change. And uh, that's the basis why Carey is claiming such a huge time depth of this uh, language family. Uh, it's an old idea. It's just a new version that Carey chooses to formulate it. Uh, originally, it was stated by Sapir. And uh, 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 a bit later, I will quote Sapir, 1921, on this conservative. Uh, there is a recent study by Carey and uh, Smith uh, who have collected and mapped over 900 place names for Upper Kaskakwin, including uh, various objects such as streams, lakes, mountains, and so, so forth. Uh, and all of them, uh, with very few exceptions, such as the village Nikolai, uh, are native words, native descriptive terms. Uh, and I give a couple of examples here. Denunci Jinok, which means a red paint creek, uh, or another one, Tokunavi, where a hill comes into water. Okay. So if you know the morphology and, and meanings of all these morphemes, you, you see how these descriptions are created. And uh, we don't find any signs of borrowing any place name from any substrate language which is quite remarkable. Um, the area where the Upper Kaskakwin people live is uh, very remote, uh, uh, even uh, compared to other Athabascan groups. They are separated from the south by the Alaska Range, which is a very high uh, range of mountains. They are far from the coast, uh, much further away from the coast than many other groups. Uh, there are also similar groups on the Yukon River, but Yukon was a huge uh, highway, always. And Kaskakwim is a much smaller river, much more difficult to travel on. So even though they are connected to the sea by, the, by this river, they are still isolated. And uh, the terrain they inhabit is very difficult to cross, particularly in summer. Uh, everything is full of different lakes and, and uh, streams and all kinds of water, swamps, uh, so you, it's really hard to get anywhere uh, un until it's frozen solid. Okay? Uh, and as a result of all these kinds of isolation, 
this area was accessed uh, the least by uh, Russians during Russian American time and also by Americans during the American period. And as a result, this language survived a little bit longer and better than some other languages that were located in more accessible areas. Uh, now, um, let me move to the um, four kinds of potential external influence that could have been, happened in the case of Arpa Kaskakun. First, the surrounding Athabascan languages, then uh, Yupik Eskimo downriver, not very far away, and that's the only unrelated language in, in any reasonable distance. Then uh, Russian, beginning from the mid 19th century, and English from early 20th century. Uh, yeah, this is the part of the map that uh, I showed you already. So these are potential influence from the neighboring Athabascan languages. Uh, and uh, this dotted line connects uh, Upper Kaskapu with Lower Tanana, which is actually the closest language, and it used to be one language a couple of hundred years ago. Uh, yeah, this is uh, arrow connecting showing potential influence from Eskimo, Central Yupik, and uh, this area potential influence from uh, Russian. The Russians were based in the closest location for a long time was so-called Kalmakovsky Redoubt uh, that was established in the Russian American time and existed uh, for some decades. Uh, so <coughs> contact with other um, Athabaskan Interior Athabascan languages originally constituted, constituted a kind of dialect chain or network, and at least that concerns uh, four languages, Lower Tana, Koyakon, Kalikachuk, and Upper Kaskuk. Uh, Michael Krauss said that Athabascan languages are really parts of a dynamic complex of more or less constant interactions and influences. Uh, this, um, some in, we know that some individuals in the during the last uh, 100, 30, 40 years, moved from other groups, what, from the areas that are now associated with other tribes. And this kind of non-discreet uh, situation existed till the turn of the 20th century when the Russian Orthodox religion really became firmly established as a cultural distinction from other groups. And the villages were established and the uh, Upper Kaskakun tribe and the language became kind of consolidated. Uh, Michael Krauss, uh, a major Athabascan linguist who passed away this year, uh, had a paper in which he uh, spoke about native comparative Athabascan linguistics. And that's kind of key to our understanding how different languages uh, potentially borrow from each other. So in that paper, Krauss uh, noted that, I won't read the whole quotation, you can see it, but uh, the idea is that people from a particular group know the system of phonological correspondences with the neighboring language, and they, uh, e even if they borrow something from that other language, they recalculate it in the, exactly the same form as it would be if it were inherited from the original proto language. So, in, if that, to the extent that it's, it's uh, correct, there are some minor exceptions, but generally it's like that, and then you cannot distinguish if it's a borrowing or it's an ori original word. Or. Uh, there is, a, um, I mentioned earlier, the study by Carrie and Smith that's a really uh, impressive recent study in which they mapped thousands of place names of Athabascan languages across Alaska. Upper Kaskakum is this uh, in the middle, it's uh, light brown dots and uh, there are over 900 of them. Uh, yeah, it's, it works, doesn't work as it should but I'll manage. Yeah, let me show you just a couple of examples. Uh, uh, so, uh, light brown 
I procrastinate with place names, and pink is the color for those the place names that are registered in more than one language. Uh, yeah, uh, this one, uh, you see it, it's, re it's registered in three, like, three languages, Upper Kastakwim, Dekitan, and Denaina. The names are very similar, you can just see it, and they are just in direct correspondence with each other. They mean the same thing, a uh, stream where we kill beavers. That's the name of the Samatna River. And uh, this dot corresponds to the major river, the Kaskakrim River, which is called Dichina Ik in the upper Kaskakrim. And it's also registered in uh, one, two, three, four, four other uh, languages of Alaska. And it's the same, the same name. It means Timber, timber River. Uh, so, um, borrowing from other languages is really hard to detect, okay? Uh, I'll be skipping some parts. Now, uh, let me come to the contact with the Yupik Eskimo. Uh, generally, Athabascans are known uh, as uh, people who avoid contact with strangers. Uh, Sapir wrote that the Athabascan languages of America are spoken by people that have astonishingly varied cultural context, yet nowhere do we find that an Athabascan dialect is borrowed at all freely from a neighboring language. That's a, a true generalization. Um, we're finding really few Yupik borrowings in, in Upper Kaskakrim. Previously, at the previous conference, I mentioned the word for salt, which was borrowed from Central Yupik. Uh, through the mediation of another Athabascan language. And uh, then uh, the very last example on this slide, the endearing particle Wuluk, uh, is actually was actually found uh, thanks to the previous conference. But Michael Fortescue standing here was uh, giving some Greenlandic examples, and I, I hear suddenly hear this particle, and then I looked up Central Yupik. It's the same, almost the same as in Greenlandic, and that's how it came to Upper Kaskakrim. And basically, it's the only example of a direct borrowing from uh, Eskimo that I have to date. Uh, in the middle of this screen, there are a couple, couple of other uh, borrowings. Uh, one is for pipe, and the other one for window. Uh, they are really difficult to find and. Uh, uh, they both come from mediation of some other Athabascan language that was in a closer contact with Eskimo than Upper Kaskakrim. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, there was definitely avoidance of contact with Yupik till the beginning of the Russian period. Not 100% avoidance, but a tendency, like a tendency. Uh, but in the cases of rare contacts, that Athabascans uh, usually developed a limited knowledge of other languages. It's known about other places, not about this one, we can just guess. Um, what happens in the case of context is that uh, um, other speakers of other languages cannot learn Athabascan in a second language. Uh, that's a general uh, situation. It's, uh, they are so difficult that you can only pick it up as a baby. Uh, and uh, also Athabascans don't like other people uh, uh, still, from the turn of the 20th century, Eskimos were gradually becoming kind of intermediaries between Russians and, and the Athabascans of Central Alaska because they all became Orthodox. And uh, some Eskimo priests were visiting, and in that capacity, they all were welcome in the Athabascan area. Also, there is a general process of Eskimos gradually expanding upriver. That, that's a process that lasted in Alaska for thousands of years since the Eskimos first arrived there. So they are a coastal people with marine kind of uh, economy and uh, organization of life, but they were generally penetrating along the rivers in the inland, and it was happening till the most recent times, including the 20th century. There was one exceptional <coughs> individual who married into upper custom women in the early 20th century and apparently became a fluent speaker. And uh, according to the interview,
interview, interviews that we did, uh, his son was kind of bilingual. He knew some Yupik, uh, but his daughter, who is still living, doesn't know a single word of Yupik. So he completely changed his uh, his um, linguistic uh, identity when he married into this community. Uh, yeah, here it's a comparison uh, between Upper Kaskakum and Dekhinagor in Gaelic, a quotation from Ken van der Fort's uh, paper, uh, who correctly um, states that uh, these, were, these two groups had different strategies. In Gaelic, are actually a dip, uh, particular Athabascan group that uh, allowed, allowed uh, contact with Eskimos and adopted a lot from the Eskimo culture. And uh, in that uh, sense, uh, the upper caste queen or Kolchans were all different. Uh, I guess I'll take some time from the discussion period. Uh, so, um, Afrikaanskakum is really a typical Athabascan language. In Gaelic, or like Finag is atypical, and Afrikaanskakum is a typical with, with respect to language context. Very few lexical borrowing from an unrelated language, no, no grammatical borrowing. Uh, verb structure, by the way, prevents borrowing in principle, but it's almost excluded. Um, and uh, generally, it seems that uh, Athabascan historically developed a highly complex and impenetrable system and were kind of content with it for a long, very long time. And there is not a hint of participating in some kind, any kind of linguistic area, God forbid, Sprachbund, anywhere in the places in, in North America where these languages are spoken. Uh, now contact with Russian, which started uh, uh, with the arrival of Lavrentiy Zagoskin in 1844, or maybe a few years earlier, and lasted well beyond the official end of uh, Russian America uh, into, into the 20th century. Uh, I don't think we would ever find any evidence that upper caste between people learned to speak Russian. They did learn Slavonic prayers by heart, and uh, we recorded some people who still could do that, but uh, they never understood a word of what they were saying and singing. Uh, uh, there are about 80 nouns borrowed from Russian in, the, in this language. Generally, Athabascans, uh, even, even though they don't borrow anything from other native languages, they kind of open up for borrowing in the situation of culture shock when they meet Europeans. Uh, Russians in Alaska, French and English people in, in Canada, Spanish in Navajo, they kind of open up for a short while and then they close down again. Uh, so um, in, in these nouns there are some borrowed phonemes including B and R in some words. And it seems that the upper caste of people learned a number of individual Russian words, including Sukhali, crackers, and Mirshuk, sack. And uh, um, I hypothesized that this is a kind of borrowing that should have taken place, not in the situation of real bilingualism, but in some kind of extensive demonstration and designation, like when person is visiting to a store and is, is shown something in Sukhari, oh, Sukhali, okay. That's how it possibly can emerge. Um, most of, the, of this uh, Russian borrowed nouns actually came through the mediation of another Athabascan language and sometimes also an Eskimo language. Um, the word for tea kettle is Tainich, from Russian Chinese, and it came apparently through the mediation of Denaina, which had, that has Chinese. Uh, how, how is that possible? Because the upper caste of people knew that where uh, Denaina has Ch, 
they must have c, and where the nine has k, they must have ch. And that's how signage comes up. So this comparative at best linguistics of crowds. In comparison, when they borrow some words from Yupik, and there are a few examples like Kalandasik uh, from Russian Kalandash, uh, that's from Yupik Kalantasak, with this nominative case ending, they know that Yupik is not related, so they don't have to recalculate anything. They just uh, reproduce it as good as they can. And what is particularly interesting, there are some words that were borrowed from uh, uh, directly from some Athabaskan language, but uh, in that language, that the word was ori originally came not directly from Russian, but from Yupik. So Russian, Yupik, Athabaskan, Abkhazian. And uh, there is, a, for example, the word, <laughs> the word <laughs> uh, manjak for jar, and uh, we we don't have registered uh, evidence which at best language it came from, maybe the nine, but it's somehow not documented there. Uh, but in central music, this word sounds like pan up from Russian panka. When you see that at the best when they upper when they borrow it from another language, they know that this last uh, phoneme should not be changed because it's some something non Athabascan. They know that the k is an Eskimo ending, kind of know. And they don't say manjac, they say manjac. That's, uh, I just realized that recently, and I think that this remarkable evidence of some kind of partial familiarity with the difference between Athabasca and Yupik. Uh, so generally, Russian loans shed light on old language contact. Most Russian loan words actually arrived via the mediation of another language, including some Athabaskan and Eskimo. Uh, there is this concept of narrative comparative linguistics flowing from all neighboring languages. And this shows that there must have been some Athabaskan borrowing as well. We just we cannot detect it because of this recalculation. Uh, contact with Eskimo languages happened mostly via the mediation of Athabaskan. There are a few direct examples like Kalandasak, but few. Uh, and, uh, but, so there was some limited direct contact with both Russian and Central Yupik. And thus, uh, taking all this into consideration, we can kind of reconstruct the old network of interlanguage relationships. Uh, the Russian laws are a uh, window onto a process that is otherwise very obscure. Uh, there, is a, there was also a contact with English that uh, started in early 1900s. There are some early borrowings from this time, uh, such as Fala Ina, where Fala is uh, from Pelo, and Ina is an um, Athabascan plural, and, uh, and Fa is not native uh, phoneme or phoneme in this word. There was a very limited bilingualism in the first half of the 20th century. Uh, tomorrow, Marina Rasplatina will be talking about the context with Anglo people during this period of time. Uh, the context became really massive uh, when the missionary school opened in 1948. And then uh, the events developed very quickly. Bilingualism spread, um, um, affected the whole community in the next decade. And those who were born in the 1940s became kind of balanced bilingual, bilinguals. And those who were born later already were more native English speakers. So language shift happened really abruptly in one gen just one generation. And now, uh, when younger people who know some of the language are asked, why don't, you, what, why don't you speak your language, you know it. It's too difficult. So now they have a feeling that it's very complicated language compared to English. So they, this complex, complexity kind of preserved this language is intact for millennia, but now it speeds up very fast. So that's a paradoxical situation. Uh, to conclude, uh, sorry for taking so long, but it's, it's the last slide. Uh, to get, uh, recapitulate what I've been saying, there are a whole set of converging causes behind this unusual purity. 
including long residence in the area without any unrelated languages in the vicinity, geographical isolation, this capacity of native comparative knowledge, typical of other Basques, uh, general disinclination to borrowing or geolinguistic conservatism, as Harry calls it, uh, scarcity of contact with Yupik, and of bilingualism in Yupik, if it existed at all, uh, lack of bilingualism in Russian, and also a very brief period of partial bilingualism in English. Uh, so all these causes have led to the situation we, um, of uh, unusual purity we observe now. And on this final slide, you see the names of some of my consultants. Fortunately, all of them are gone by now. Uh, these were wonderful speakers of this language. Thank you. Would you go along with those linguists who would say that uh, the process of borrowing is not typical for Native American languages uh, and that the, uh, the uh, kind of lack of borrowings or uh, language contact that you're speaking about could also be a result uh, of uh, translating the concepts and topologies instead of borrowing them. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and how you would characterize this difference uh, in relation to the situation that we have in Eurasia, where borrowing and substrates are commonplace everywhere in the Arctic? Uh, and it might, it, it, would, it would seem to be the case that also here some kind of shifts been going on towards a direction which resembles the Eurasian language for the situation. How would you see Thank that? Thank you for your question. It allows me to show you a slide I had to give you. Uh, it's, uh, it's about the uh, Hupa, a language of California, uh, shown show with the mm, blue area where, where it is. Uh, there is an interesting study by Brown, 1999, in which he was uh, looking at the share um, of borrowings from European languages and Native American languages uh, as compared to those words that were constructed from indigenous material. And he came up with two kinds of metrics. One is very simple percentage of borrowed vocabulary, and the other one is what he calls convergence index. It varies from minus one, uh, that is for, it, for the languages that uh, only coin uh, words, use words coined on the basic basis of native material. Uh, two plus one, exclusive borrowing. And Kuba, which is a typical Athabascan language, that by the way traveled all the way through dozens of other languages to where they are now, from the north. Uh, has the, uh, a 20 percent uh, percentage index and a minus uh, 0.67 uh, convergence index, which is uh, almost the absolute minimum. So even although you are right that there is such a trend between difference between Eurasia and North America, at the best are really extreme even in this um, uh, you know in this context. I think I have a couple of questions, but uh, uh, they are about uh, uh, the London wars. Uh, can it be real, said with certainty, that, uh, we, um, that uh, there are absolutely no um, uh, phonetic or phonological criteria to distinguish uh, inherited words and long, uh, from, from London words uh, within the family? Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, the only case when you can uh, identify a loan word would be if they recalculate wrongly. And there is one instance that I found like that. That's a river outside of the Upper Kaskakun area. Uh, I showed this in this slide in my uh, other presentation, not here. It's a uh, so-called Susitna River, which is a major river south of the Alaska Range. It's in the, in the Denina area, and that means sand river, but Upper Kaskokon people fail to understand the sand river, and they're calculated in their own way, uh, so uh, 
they call it Shashutna, which, which doesn't make any sense from the, in terms of its etymology. And then we see that it's really borrowed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess I should uh, dig through all the lexicon of the language and uh, have a kind of table in which I uh, compare each word to all the words of four or five neighboring languages, and maybe I find a handful of long words like that. <coughs> Do you entirely accept the hypothesis that these figures uh, just know uh, the phonetic correspondences and uh, uh, somehow use this knowledge uh, uh, while borrowing the words? Uh, we, um, in, uh, in, in the Uranic studies, we have a very similar uh, naturalization hypothesis uh, mm, uh, in the case of the Finnish and Sami. And, uh, uh, well, this is. Uh, there, there we uh, just discover some problems with it. Uh, yeah, but from what, what I understand, uh, as far as I understand, the Finnish and Sami are far more distant than these languages mm -hmm. from each other. So. They, uh, I don't think they were really, really multilingual. They just understood. Some loan words, some alleged loan words, just turned turn out uh, still inherited. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, the traditional system was people kind of were used to understanding their neighbors. They didn't switch to the languages. They didn't really learn them, but they uh, had the experience of understanding each other, and they, they knew what this guy says. Uh, could, I, uh, it should always be be sure. And uh, if I borrow some this is just, this is just funny name, word for, for him, I just I should change it. Something like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the last question is: uh, uh, Can we still suppose that uh, there are some early learned words uh, that are, uh, however, uh, hard to recognize uh, due to some phonetic change? Uh, well, there are various uh, complexities, like, for example, Koyokon, uh, it's, uh, well, I think of it as a single language, but in fact it has several dialects that have different uh, reflexes of proto Basque consonants. So maybe there you can find uh, these kind of examples when you um, cannot come up with a reasonable hypothesis how this borrowing could have come from a neighboring dialect, but it came from a distant dialect, something like that. But I guess it's, it's possible. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, let me just say that uh, what I can suppose preliminary uh, listening to you is that all of this situation uh, just um, uh, indicates that uh, historical phonology of Athabaskan is undeveloped. Uh, no, it means that uh, it means that the uh, uh, general theory of uh, historical language change is wrong. Uh, it means that the general uh, theory of how languages uh, develop and the, according to the tree uh, genealogical tree model is basically a very limited view and. Uh, there are all kinds of complications to this ideal picture. And actually, let me show the one slide uh, that I also... So it is theory that has problems. That uh, I also skipped. Mm, it's really interesting. It's a quotation from my personal correspondence with Michael Krauss, who said that in 1962, I encountered three Waska brothers. Uh, on a sandbar at the Tatlivos, so it's a river uh, in, in Gallic or Dekinak area, who spoke Yupik with each other, but remembered Kaskakum and Gallic with uh, um, this um, two series of consonants that are reconstructed for the Basman, th, ts, and ch, uh, uh, with three, two, and one series. So three different brothers has three different uh, merger systems uh, through bro three brothers on one sandbar managing to belong to three different Athabascan substocks of Hoyer's 1963 book. So according to Hoyer's generalization, uh, people speaking these three kinds of systems 
uh, must have uh, diverged several thousand years ago, but they are still brothers. <laughs> Was it born from the same parents? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the case of uh, internal uh, variation in Athabasca languages. I didn't pursue this because it's kind of separate from my main topic, but I'm glad that we came upon it. <laughs>